I want to start with a story about race and, and doing your job. And so jury selection is super hard. First time I met Jeff was uh, at NCDC when he was doing voir dire. Uh, and I was like, oh, wow, if I could do that, I would not lose trials. Um, <laughs> but I can't, and I did. Um, anyway, uh, as Jeff said, I practice in Essex County, New Jersey, which is where Newark is. And it's a, a pretty diverse uh, county, but not so when you look at clients who were all people of color and predominantly black and also not true when you look at jury pools who were predominantly white. And the prosecutors in Essex County um, hadn't read Batson, so they had a pretty uh, easy way to pick juries, which is if you were white, you were good, and if you were black, you weren't. Um, and what that meant was they were using lots of their many peremptory challenges on black folks, and we were struggling to keep black folks on juries. But there were a couple uh, liberal suburbs where there were white people, and. Prosecutors were too dumb to realize that, so they'd leave them on because they were white, and we were like, oh, we can, we can work with these jurors here. And so this woman comes up, and she, very preliminary stuff, and I know immediately that I love her, and I want her to shut up and not say anything else so as to tip off the prosecutor that she's such a great juror. She says, uh, I'm a professor at Monmouth University. I also do a literacy class in the prison. I'm like, shut up, shut up, right? <laughs> But she gets through all the, the, you know, can you be fair, questions, fine. And I'm like, great, this is perfect. And then she says, but judge, can I be heard at sidebar? Oh, man, this can't go well, right? And she says, listen, I think in the interest of full candor, we don't want full candor here, in the interest of full candor, I should tell you that I teach criminal justice and I teach it from a critical perspective. And so, right, there's like a white noise machine on and we're speaking in hushed tones so the rest of the room can't hear what we're saying. And the judge says, and Hushman, well, what does that mean? You teach it from a critical perspective. And she says, in a very matter of fact way, well, I present my students with the data, and they invariably come to the conclusion that our criminal justice system is racist and class biased. At which point he blows his, are this high school students still here? He blows his fucking lid, right? <laughs> he goes totally ape shit. How dare you say that? I can't believe they let you teach this at a public university. Monmouth University, it's a private university. He wasn't that smart, right? Um, th that's outrageous. And then he turns to me and he says, Mr. Shalom doesn't think the system is racist and class bias. He wouldn't work in the system if he thought it was racist and class bias. And right, this is jury selection, so you've got to keep that shit-eating grin on your face to make it look <laughs> like you want to hear about these people's boring lives. And you're doing that, and I've got to keep smiling as he says, I'm like, I feel like I'm eating shit here, right? And there really aren't high school kids here. Yeah, good, okay. Um, anyway, so suffice it to say, my perfect juror gets excused for cause. And I go home that night, and I'm stewing, not just because I lost the perfect juror, but because it offended me. It offended me to my core that he would link me in with his nonsensical notions of what the system is. And the thing is, so this was 2006, and uh, Google was like a thing then. It had just started becoming a thing that you could Google jurors. Prosecutors hadn't figured it out yet, we had. And so I went home and I Googled this juror, because she had told me her name and where she lived and where she worked. And I sent her an email. And I said, hey, listen, I just want you to know, I don't work in the system because I think it's not racist. I work in the system because I think it is racist. And it's super fucked up. And she sent me back one of these responses that you had to keep scrolling through and scrolling through and scroll. Thank you so much for writing. I was feeling so guilty. He humiliated me. I wonder whether I should have just shut up. Uh, right. And, and this is the paragraph that was important here, uh, where she says, but I'm going to have another chance. In New Jersey, you're called for two days of jury selection. Uh, and later on that following day, after I sent this email, I went to meet a colleague for lunch who was just finishing picking a jury, and sure enough, the juror was on uh, the next jury, and the client was acquitted. Did, <laughs> did better than my client. Okay. When I worked as a public defender, my boss used to always say very clearly and correctly that we represent clients, not causes. And I think that's true, but I think it only goes so far, because I think there are opportunities to do both. Always in service of your client, but there are times when educating decision makers about causes will advance the interests of your client. Because I think when we, the, the way we best represent our client, and, and so this was particularly true for me, uh, was to, to, to show them a certain disconnect, right? We had to talk effectively to the, judge, to the decision makers, sometimes judges, sometimes juries, 
But the problem was that my clients, as I said, were all people of color, almost all black, and the judges looked like this, right? A bunch of white people. And jury pools often looked like this, also a bunch of white people. And I should tell you that when you need a picture for a PowerPoint presentation, you Google big group of white people, the one that comes up, if you look at the white person in the middle, it's actually a bronze statue because it's from the Oscars, right? Like that's where you can find the biggest group of white people, apparently, other than in Essex County jury pools. Or the Klan, right. Or the U.S. Senate, or, right. Lots of, lots of other places I could have found the same thing. But right, the, the, to me, in, in cop cases, this isn't true when you had a complaining witness, right, in an ID case, but when, when the key witness in the case is a cop, the hardest thing for me to do was to convince the white judges who live typically in rich suburbs that the experiences of my black clients were real, right? Because their experiences were co with cops were this, right? Hey, I'm, I'm just here, I'm a nice guy, the D.A.R.E. program, all this nonsensical stuff, right? And of course, the experiences of my clients were characterized by humiliation, degradation, and abuse by police officers. But convincing the decision makers that the lived experiences of our clients are real went an incredibly long way. And the only way to convince them that those are real is to convince them that their nonsensical, outdated notions aren't just outdated, they weren't even true back then. Okay, so to get to the, the, the question that, that Jeff kind of teased, how can you as criminal defense lawyers advance kind of broader interests in racial justice in a way that helps your client? So I want to tell you about a case of mine. It was one of the first cases I had uh, when I came to the ACLU uh, on behalf of a guy named Joel Barnes, and there were a, a bunch of other folks involved. But so there were these cops, there was this group of cops in Camden, New Jersey which uh, at the time was still kind of consistently being voted the most dangerous city in America, who were unusually lucky. These jerks, uh, this property seizure report here is not a Camden Police Department report. This was something they did on their own to brag about how much contraband they were seizing. And here's the thing, it turns out it's really easy to, steal, uh, to, to seize a lot of contraband if you're just planting it on people, right? If you're stealing it and planting it, your arrest numbers and your seizure numbers are better than average, it turns out, right? So uh, with the lucky cops, you also had unlucky clients. And, and so one of them was Joel Barnes. And that's a, a nice handsome picture of Joel put out by the ACLU. And so let me just tell you a little bit about what happened to Joel. Uh, so he is in a house that's not his, it's a friend's house. They were gonna, he was trying to get people together to clean up his aunt's yard for a cookout that afternoon. And police come in without a warrant. Uh, they come in and they, they kind of gather everyone in the kitchen and they say, where's the shit at? And, and Joel knew what they were talking about in generic terms, right? He knew they were talking about where are the drugs, but he didn't know where the shit was at. He didn't know where the drugs were. And so there's this back and forth and they go back and forth for a while. Where's the shit at? I don't know, where's the shit, right? And eventually they put him in a cop car, cuffed, and they say, listen, they, and they bring out a, a brown paper bag, a small brown paper bag, like a lunch bag that my kid would bring to school. And they say, either you tell us where the shit's at, or this is yours. And he didn't know where the shit's at. He didn't tell them where it was. And in that bag was marijuana laced with PCP. And so uh, PCP sentencing in, I think, everywhere, but certainly in New Jersey, is, is even more out of whack than other drug sentencing. And so based on the quantity of weight of the marijuana with PCP, it was what was called a first degree crime in New Jersey. So someone without a criminal record was looking at 10 to 20 years. Someone with a criminal record was looking at 10 years to life, okay? Um, and so Joel goes home, he actually gets out on bail, he tells his mom what happened, and she says that's bullshit. Then he tells his lawyer, she doesn't use that word, she was nicer than I was, tells his lawyer what happened, and the lawyer doesn't believe him. It's like kind of a far-fetched story. And then they offer him a deal, right? As often happens, four years, two without parole. And he's thinking, man, I can't convince my mom. How am I gonna do with that group of Hollywood actors who are our, our jury pool? I, I, I gotta take this deal. And so he goes to prison, and he's sitting in prison. He's there for about a year, and he gets a call from his mom. And his mom says, Joel, these cops just got arrested by the FBI. And he says, who? 
and she reads the names of the four cops who arrested, and they were the four cops who arrested him. And they were arrested by the FBI for planting drugs on clients, stealing evidence, paying, did anyone watch The Shield? Right? Shield was a surprisingly good show. It had that guy Michael Chiklis, I like his haircut. But it was a really good show. Uh, and in the first episode, this doesn't ruin much for you, it's these dirty cops in LA, and in the first episode, they murder someone. You're like, oh, this is not your typical cop show. Uh, and these guys in Camden thought that that was like a blueprint, apparently, for how you do good policing. And so uh, by the time we got involved in Joel's case, he had been released from prison, along with 185 other people who had their convictions dismissed. And we brought a civil suit on his behalf. Uh, ultimately, 87 people brought civil suits and they were settled with the city of Camden for three and a half million dollars. But Joel fit the pattern of those 185 people who were targeted by these dirty cops, which is to say he was poor, he was a person of color, and most importantly, he had a criminal record, right? So they weren't targeting uh, people they thought were gonna be believed. They knew that there were biases built into our criminal justice system to make it less likely that he would be believed. A and so, I tell you this story not because it's about race, it is about policing, um, but there's an interesting kind of footnote in the story which is as we're going through the civil discovery and we're trying to show, as, as we're required to in the 1983 suit, that the city knew that these cops were bad. We found a really interesting thing and it was an unsung hero and it was uh, a public defender, uh, so not even a real lawyer, it was a public defender, right? Um, I'm kidding. Uh, and she noticed something that institutional defenders have the opportunity to do, right? Which is, man, these cops are getting really lucky, unusually lucky, and I recognize these names. And so with that information, she filed a motion in court that was opposed by the Camden County Prosecutor's Office and the city of Camden, saying, I want these guys' IA records because something smells rotten here, right? And it's important to note one thing when we think about Ms. Felder here, which is she files this motion. She lost. Of course she lost, because we never win those motions, right? And it was years before these cops were criminally prosecuted. But it's the reason we won the case. The civil case in the end, Joel and the other folks arrested with him got some measure of justice because Felicia Felder filed that motion. Without it, we were sunk. OK. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about ways in which civil rights organizations like the ACLU can collaborate with institutional defenders. And, and by that, I mean the ACDL, which we do in New Jersey. I mean uh, public defender offices. And, and I'm going to do it quickly on bail reform. And, and I'm not trying to steal Brandon or Colette's thunder. Nice pictures of them both. Um, but, but let me just say this. So we have bail reform in New Jersey that went into effect on January 1st. And, one, and we're really excited about it. We think it's a real opportunity to help reduce the mass incarceration crisis in our state. Um, but one of the things we're confronting is that the people who don't like it are the bail bond industry, right? They're, they kind of hate it. And they want to do everything they can to discredit this reform so you don't bring it back to your state and say, see, look, in the last nine months, we've set eight money bails in this state, and it's working. They want to show failures. So every time someone gets out on pretrial release on non-monetary conditions and commits a new crime, they're plastering it all over social media. They're trying to, to make a big buzz. So we decided at a certain point, we want to fight that because we know there are people who are benefiting from bail reform. We know there are people who are staying out of jail, are keeping their jobs, their custody, their apartments, things like that. And so we hired a PR firm to help us tell the story and it's really hard to find those stories. Not because they don't exist, but because you're dealing with people who often were erroneously arrested. They don't want to say like, listen, when I got arrested on that child porn charge, I was able to keep my job. <laughs> like that doesn't play that well for them. Uh, and so we've been working with the Office of the Public Defender to identify clients who are not putting themselves at risk, right? Because again, clients above causes first and foremost. But if you have, a, so they have helped us identify a woman who was arrested, not the target of a search warrant, but a, uh, her boyfriend was, and they execute the search warrant and find a boatload of drugs in her house. And she's charged, again, with a first degree crime. She has, she's in her 30s with no criminal record. Under the old money bail scheme, her bail would have been like a quarter million dollars. Under the current scheme, she was rele released on a bracelet, and last Friday had it cut off when the case was dismissed. So right, that's a good, powerful story that I hope you'll be reading about in a reputable publication in, in, in weeks and months to come. But 
The only way you can find that is with the help of the criminal defense community. And so that is a, a time, and, and it serves their interests, and it serves uh, the kind of broader social justice interests. So, right, I, I want to talk for a second about how do we educate client, uh, judges, jurors, about issues of race, because they don't like talking about it. It makes them super awkward. Uh, because then they, they, they haven't done the, the Jeff talk, because that's our own failing, that we haven't gotten them to hear the Jeff talk, but they think that when you talk about race, you're saying they own slaves, right? And they, that, that show of hands thing is really effective, and it, it take, makes them feel less defensive. Um, but there are certain realities that they have to know. And so one of them is that people aren't policed equally, right? And, and one thing you can do is you can talk about uh, what our prisons and jails look like, the, the demographics of our prisons and jails compared to our country, our state, our communities. But I think that inherently runs into the racist response of, well, black people must be committing more crime, which is why they're going to jail more. Everything's working exactly as planned. And it is working as planned, but it's just a different plan than the one they're talking about, right? And, and so we have to confront this idea about different levels of criminality. And I think, to me, the way I like doing it most is with pot, because pot's fun, right? But all, the other thing about pot is that it is one of the rare things where we know how often white folks get high and how often black folks get high from you know, kind of reputable federal government data that says we all get high roughly the same amount, right? Like it, it's a lot and it's uniform, right? And, and so with that in mind, it's important to talk about the enforcement of marijuana laws because we know what the usage is, so we can't say it's that certain people are committing crimes more. And so the ACLU put out a, a nationwide study in, I'm making it up, but I think it was 2014, could have been 2015, uh, oh, 2013, if my eyes were better. Um, right, and what it showed is that nationwide, as a you know, proportion of their, uh, the, the amount of the population they comprise, African Americans are 3.7 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than white folks. There are certain states and certain counties that are much higher. I will recommend you check out the, the report because at the end there's an appendix that's broken down by state and uh, in, in most states also by county, so you can see which counties are the most disparate. This is effective. In New Jersey, we went a step further and looked at other low-level offenses. So in in those four cities, Jersey City, Elizabeth, New Brunswick, and Millville, we looked at uh, marijuana possession, loitering, um, defiant trespass, and disorderly conduct, right? So not the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby, right? We're talking about low-level stuff here, and what we found, that it varied based on offense and based on uh, city, but in no, for no offense in no city was the disparity less than three times, and in some it approached ten times right, nine point something. Now, I, I think there's an important conversation to have. Well, let, let me just say one more thing and, and I, before I talk about that important conversation. I don't want to steal Nooses, Thunder, you're going to hear from her tomorrow, another lovely picture. Um, but I want to talk about a case of hers. Um, so so Noose and, and others at the ACLU, Jason Williamson and others, um, learned that in Milwaukee, as in lots of other cities, there were a couple things happening. Thing number one is that stops and frisks were going up, and reasonable suspicion wasn't, right? So you had the same number of people who were kind of doing bad stuff, but lots of people were being stopped and frisked. And as is true, as I said, in, in most places, this wasn't happening throughout Milwaukee. This wasn't happening everywhere. This was happening in predominantly African-American neighborhoods and, and Latino neighborhoods. And so, there were racial disparities everywhere, uh, in traffic stop data, which was Milwaukee police's own data, right? So this isn't some hippie civil rights group. This was the cops' own data, seven times more likely if you're African-American, five times more likely if you're Hispanic to be targeted for a traffic stop than if you're white. And, right, grossly disproportionate with the share of the population. And so, so uh, the ACLU of Wisconsin and uh, ACLU National filed a, a civil rights lawsuit. And, and, here's, and so that lawsuit challenges under the Fourth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, right? So talking about that there are too many stops and that certain people are being targeted by those stops, 
the, the practice of stop and frisk as carried out in Milwaukee, and asks the federal court to declare the policy unconstitutional, prohibit its enforcement, um, and collect data so we can kind of really track this over time. Now, Noose isn't here yet, so I can say this, but I, I also don't know. They might not win this lawsuit, right? At the ACLU, we win some and we lose some, like everywhere else. It's going to be a win for the people of Milwaukee, whether we win or lose. Because when you get the chief of police having to say things like, well, of course there are racial disparities in the stops, that's helpful, right? That helps educate people about how fucked up the system is, right? And so sometimes we win even when we lose. OK, and, and so there's lots of other opportunities for collaboration that particularly institutional defenders can, can do. Dirty cop databases. In New Jersey, Jennifer Saletti helped create a database in, in one county. And what we found was they were able to find one cop. They were able to uh, you know, document one cop who perjured himself. He uh, filled out a search warrant affidavit and then went before the grand jury and said, we got this information from a confidential witness, from a CI, CW. And in fact, it was from the complaining witness in the case that they got the information about, right? And so they used it, they confronted the, the cop with it on cross-examination, it was really effective in that one case for that one defendant. But because they now had a database, that information was available to every person, every case that that cop was in, they then used that transcript. And they started building a record of where this guy was gonna testify and I'll tell you where he testifies now. Nowhere, right? They so thoroughly discredited him by using that one transcript. Well, you're willing to lie before the grand jury. You swore the same. Like, you know how the, how the cross-examination goes. Um, those databases are incredibly important. And it's not just cops, right? How about judges that are idiots, right? It might be too big a, a database management project. Um, <laughs> but I'll give you an example. In New Jersey, we had... Um, we have this thing called plea cutoff, which is like the last chance for the judge to try to scare the shit out of a client to get him to plead. And so at that thing, they are supposed to go through the exposure and say, here's what you're facing. And it's a murder case, and the judge says to the guy, listen, I know you don't like the plea that you've been offered. 45 years is a long time. But I just want to tell you, if you're convicted, I'm going to give you life. You can check my record. And sure enough, we checked his record. And he had given every trial client life on murders. And so we went before the New Jersey Supreme Court on that case. And what I argued to them is, listen, I don't think this is different. I think the only thing different about this case is that this judge was dumb enough to say what everyone else does, right? You need to do something about trial taxes on a bigger level. They, of course, didn't. They were like, just don't say it again. It's really bad to say it, um, right? But I will promise you that judge like, this is, this is a great sentencing argument in any case that judge has. And that judge is going to have to be hypervigilant to not give trial taxes to anyone since he was dumb enough to put it on the record. But it only works if people know about it. Again, a database management problem. Um, but here's one where civil rights attorneys have the opportunity to help out public defenders. So this is a study that I did. Uh, which was just total plagiarism from a study uh, done in California. But what we did is we took a five and a half year period uh, in New Jersey and we looked at every case where the New Jersey appellate courts had considered issues of prosecutorial misconduct. And then we went and checked our like antiquated database system to figure out who the actual prosecutors were, the, the assistant prosecutors on the case, to find out are prosecutors recidivists, right? And, and that was kind of the question. And as we would hope, I guess, mostly they weren't. Mostly you had prosecutors who screwed up no times or one time. You had a small subset of people who screwed up two times. And then you had this like fearsome fivesome who had four or more instances where they had been cited by courts for misconduct, sometimes the same misconduct. We asked the attorney general to keep that database. They told us to get lost. We asked the courts to. They told us to get lost. And then something really fortuitous happened, which is we do a lot of amicus work at the New Jersey Supreme Court, and we were just checking the cases. And the question in the case was, did the conduct in this case constitute reversible error, misconduct from the prosecutor? And we went and we looked, and what had happened in this particular case was, as the defendant, defense attorney is summing up, 
The complaining witness is paraded into the courtroom by prosecutors, investigators. And the defense attorney says, judge, this, they, they're trying to throw me off my game. They're trying to distract from my thing. This is a stunt during my summation. It's inappropriate. And the judge says, oh, we don't even know if it was intentional. And the thing is, the great, great thing is we went and looked who the prosecutor was. And you know what? He had been cited once before for pulling a stunt during summation. So we got the appellate court to say, like, naivete has its limits, right? Like, let's not pretend. And so we went before the Supreme Court and we said, you've got to keep this database. They're not doing it. You've got to. And they cited to our study and said, no, get lost. But <laughs> again, we sometimes win by losing because it gets them thinking about these issues and, and maybe even reading it. Probably not that. Um, I want to say that civil rights lawsuits are also a really good resource for criminal defense attorneys. So right before I started at the ACLU, we, actually the, my second day at work, so I had nothing to do with it, we filed a complaint against the Newark Police Department. Uh, this is the cover sheet. There were, uh, it was like a 180 page document that documented 413 different instances of misconduct by the Newark Police Department in inadequate internal affairs department that they routinely violated search and seizure protocols and we were asking the Civil Rights Division, remember when we had one of those? They're asking the Civil Rights Division to conduct an invest, a pattern and practice investigation into the Newark Police Department. Now, uh, they are still, like there's now a consent decree that you know, may or may not bring justice to the people of Newark, but what it is going to do, what it has already done, is it's a super effective cross-examination tool, right? Because again, what we're trying to counteract is this image of hero cop protector who comes into the neighborhood and when on jurors' mind and on judges' minds is this, this rampant misconduct, then, then you're starting to dismantle that image of hero cop. Okay, so I, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, putting it to use in, in actual litigation. And so, um, I don't wanna steal Rashawn's thunder, another <laughs> handsome picture. Um, you're gonna see why I have all these handsome pictures. And, and, and this is a case uh, that the ACLU of Massachusetts uh, was able to participate in, uh, Commonwealth v. Warren from last year, and let me just give a little background first. I don't even know if you can read that, sorry. Um, ACLU of Massachusetts issued a study, again, a couple years before that, maybe it was in 2014, about the Boston Police Department. You're gonna be shocked to learn this, but the Boston Police Department was racist, which is so weird since it's Boston and a police department. <laughs> but it turns out the Boston Police Department was racist. Um, and it documented their stop and frisk practices, uh, FIO encounters are, are their, their stops and searches, right? And that they were disproportionately targeting people of color and including innocent people of color and especially innocent people of color. The court, this is the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts said, so this was a case where uh, the reasonable suspicion against Mr. Warren was flight from police only, not flight plus anything, flight only. And this is pretty powerful, right? They talk about the finding that black males in Boston are disproportionately and repeatedly targeted for FIO encounters suggests a reason for flight totally unrelated to consciousness of guilt. Such an individual when approached by the police might just as easily be motivated by the desire to avoid the recurring indignity of being racially profiled as by the desire to hide criminal activity. Given this reality for black males in the city of Boston, a judge should, in appropriate cases, consider the report's findings in weighing flight as a factor in the reasonable suspicion analysis. That's good stuff, right? That's from the top appellate court in Massachusetts. And so I've got two New Jersey examples because I've got to have a little Jersey pride here, um, right? So this is uh, many years before that in New Jersey. You guys remember Hodari D? That was the dropsy case, the US Supreme Court where Scalia in like typical Scalia fashion quotes, uh, what is that? Uh, Proverbs, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. I will tell you that I once used that in a case where my client didn't run and I was trying to use, anyway. I, it's, so there's a good longer quote, the bold stand strong like a lion. That's the, that's the extent of my biblical knowledge. Um, but New Jersey in 1994 said Hodari D is bullshit, right? There are lots of reasons people run it and they were much more wimpy about it in New Jersey, granted years before, but they said, that some city residents may not feel entirely comfortable in the presence of some, if not all, police is regrettable but true. City residents, because we don't want to talk about race, right? But that's what they meant, and so it's like something. But here's another thing, and it also talks about collaboration between uh, PD offices and civil rights organizations. So 
New Jersey became uh, infamous in the 90s for racial profiling on the New Jersey Turnpike. This was something first identified by the Office of the Public Defender, first litigated by the Office of the Pub Public Defender, and then kind of brought to justice by civil rights groups where we found, we broadly, good people, found that people of color were disproportionately being targeted on the turnpike for stops and for consent searches. And so we had, the ACLU had a client who was a dentist who drove some fancy car and had a pretty long commute where he'd have to go up and down the turnpike, an African-American dentist, and I don't remember the number, but it was something like 90 times in two years he was stopped, right? So it became a big deal. Heads kind of rolled, not enough heads rolled, but some heads rolled. New Jersey was then confronted with a case, uh, State v. Cardi, uh, where some guys were pulled over, consent search on the side of the highway, grant, consent was given, they found contraband. So from a like search and seizure standpoint, that's not a great motion to suppress, right, for the defense attorney. Because there had been so much conversation about the disproportionate targeting of drivers for consent searches, the New Jersey Supreme Court ultimately held that you couldn't even ask for consent without reasonable suspicion in cars, right? Because, because they knew, because it was in their consciousness, right? So, so it's important to start educating judges and, and it's important we've, like Tucker, they could talk about, well, it's inherently coercive in a car, but the truth is it's inherently coercive in the car and it's only happening to some of us, right? It's happening to people of color at a shockingly high rate. And I think the time to be explicit with judges about race is now. And so one last case, not on here, that I'll talk about. Uh, we, have a case, we just won a case, kind of, um, which was a Miranda issue. And so the cops are interrogating a young African-American man in a sex assault case. And he talks a little. And then he says, that's all I got to say. And we had case law in New Jersey that said, that's all I got to say is an invocation of the right to remain silent. And the trial court looked at it and they said, well, said the magic words, right to remain silent, anything you get thereafter, which included all the juicy bits, is gone. It went to the appellate division. The appellate division watched the videotape. It's a videotaped interrogation. They said, well, we looked at the defendant's demeanor. And he had a calm demeanor and a flat affect. And based on that, we don't think he meant to invoke his rights when he said, that's all I got to say. He, he obviously just meant something else. And so the punchline is the New Jersey Supreme Court uh, reversed the appellate division and, and the guy got a, he actually, his case actually was eventually dismissed. But what we argued before the New Jersey Supreme Court, uh, which they of course didn't write about, but we're trying to force them to confront uncomfortable questions about race is that in a society where black people are routinely mistreated by police, routinely murdered by police, it is, and this goes to the, the last video that Jeff showed you, young black men are taught to not get killed by police. And one way to not get killed is to stay calm, right? And so if we're gonna now use that, use this defendant's demeanor where he did what any reasonable person who didn't wanna get murdered would do against him, then we've got real problems. And again, we didn't win that. We won that case, we didn't win on that issue. But they're not gonna forget that. And, and it builds, and it builds. And so I think take every opportunity to educate judges and jurors about this stuff. And, and let me just say, obviously there's a time for it, right? Your marijuana disparity stuff, when your client gets arrested and they find a joint in his pocket and you have to go to trial, you don't go before the jury and say, listen, he had the joint, but can you believe this disproportionality? That's not a good argument, right? But when you're trying to undermine the credibility of the police officer who says, uh, here's how I selected your client out of this large group, that's the time in that motion to suppress to raise these issues, to make them confront them. And again, you might not win in that case, but unless you're educating the decision makers, you're giving up an opportunity. And so now let me get to uh, my last piece, which is slightly off topic here. Um, but you remember all these handsome pictures of the other people, right? And so these are chosen by their employers, presumably to like make them look good and smart and like they're going to take on the world. So when I was Googling around for that picture of Joel, I found a couple pictures that the ACLU put out at the time we brought this lawsuit. And I just want to quickly say thanks to the ACLU for finding the most flattering picture of me 
that they could. Because when you have a bald guy, typically what you want, who's still denying he's bald in that picture, typically what you want is a straight on the head picture. Uh, so, so thanks for that. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know where we are in time, if there's time for questions or not. but.